Capital punishment is a touchy subject for a lot of people. Some believe we have an obligation to punish criminals who commit unspeakable crimes, while others feel that no one has the right to take a life, no matter the circumstances. In the true crime story of Michaela Shunick, capital punishment was a certain possibility for her attacker, as he'd been released from prison four years earlier, but clearly hadn't changed his ways. It was only during an interrogation with investigators that it would come to light that Mickey, well, she wasn't his only victim. In May of 2012, 21-year-old Michaela Schunick, better known as Mickey, was a student at the University of Louisiana, where she was studying anthropology and living with her family in Lafayette, Louisiana. Now, for those of you who may not be too familiar with Louisiana, you should know that Lafayette, well, it's not a great place to live. According to Neighborhood Scout and Crime Data, Lafayette has a crime rate that's higher than 90% of other cities in the United States meaning it's in the top 10% of the most dangerous places to live in the entire country. For Mickey, she didn't let this statistic get in her way of living a normal life. She was a popular college student and had countless friends that she could depend on. She was described by her family as a social person, an animal lover, very likable and good at keeping commitments. In essence, she was someone you could depend on no matter what. Mickey could often be found riding her bike around town as she was in the habit of using it as her main mode of transportation but no one could have guessed that this very same bike would become a major piece of evidence in her case when Mickey suddenly disappeared. On Friday, the 18th of May in 2012, Mickey and a few of her friends attended a live music venue called Atmosphere, with Mickey having plans to attend her brother's graduation the following day. Since her family knew her to be diligent about keeping her commitments, they found it strange when they woke up on Saturday morning to find that she wasn't home, as they were supposed to ride to the ceremony together. Her family assumed that she must have slept over at a friend's house and that she would catch up with them later in the day, but she didn't. Her parents knew that she'd been with her friends all night long, and so they were sure that she was just running late. But when the time came for the ceremony to start, she still hadn't arrived, and they started to become concerned, though they were still certain that they would see her later in the day, and that she most likely would have a good explanation for missing the event. When the ceremony was over, her family traveled back home, hoping that Mickey would be there to greet them. But instead, they found the house empty, with no sign that she had been there while they were out. This is when their concern started to grow to fear, but all they could do was try to make contact with her. They called her cell phone time and time again, but got no answer. By now, they were incredibly worried. Mickey had never done anything like this before. So where was she and what could have happened? Mickey would have been mortified at missing such an important event in her brother's life and would certainly have let her family know if she was running late, but they received no word from her or from any of her friends. Her family then contacted several of her friends who confirmed that she had been at the Atmosphere venue on Friday night, along with several of her friends. Her friends say that she left the venue with a guy named Brettley Wilson to get something to eat after leaving that night. When her family reached out to Brettley, they learned that she had indeed left the club in his company and that she'd gone back to his house with him, which was located about four miles from her own home. Brettley added that they hung out until about 1.45 a.m. on Saturday at which point Mickey decided that she needed to head home. She left on her bicycle and that was the last time that he saw her. Mickey's family felt that this story made about as much sense as any, but the fact that Mickey never made it home, well, this set off alarms in their minds, especially considering Mickey had been riding around in such a dangerous town at such a concerning time of day. This was the moment when Mickey's family decided she needed to be reported missing. Finding time to unwind at the end of the day can be difficult at times, but finding something to help you unwind can be even worse. I personally try to pass the time by playing retro games or mobile games, but if I'm being honest, most of these games just aren't worth the time of day. But that's where Dice Dreams comes in. Dice Dreams is the perfect way to relax at the end of a long day. The characters are adorable and relatable, and the best part is you don't need an internet connection to play. And did I mention it's completely free? 
I love playing dice streams when I've got some free time waiting in line at a store, or just when I'm traveling around or running errands. Dice streams lets you roll the dice, attack your friends, steal coins, and build an incredible magical kingdom, and eventually become the dice king. You can create a team of friends and send them gifts, or even try to steal from them. It's totally up to you. I love building new kingdoms. It's super satisfying and kind of feels like finishing a huge puzzle. Join my Dice Dreams team for free using the link in the description. But there are only 50 spots available on my team, so be sure to join quickly. And that means joining a user base of more than 10 million players worldwide. Just click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. Thanks to Dice Dreams for sponsoring today's video. Mickey's family relayed all this information they had to investigators, and detectives immediately contacted Brettley, since at this point, he was the last person to have seen her before she vanished. During the interrogation, he went into more detail, telling the police that he and Mickey had arrived at the club at about 10.45 p.m. to have a few drinks while listening to the live bands that were playing that night. When they decided to leave, they cycled back to his house to pick up his car, and then they drove to a nearby Taco Bell to have dinner. They picked up their order and went back to his house where they ate their meal. They then got a call or text from some of their other friends who were also in the midst of ordering food. But Mickey said that she didn't feel like meeting up with them since she was already tired. So she decided to head home on her bike instead. With all of this information in mind, the next step in the investigation was to create a timeline of Mickey's movements. And to do so, CCTV cameras from the area around the club were checked to see if there was any footage to confirm Brettley's version of events. Investigators quickly found footage of Mickey and Brettley inside the club, and they confirmed that they were there for about two and a half hours. They added that the pair seemed to be enjoying themselves, and that there'd been no sign of trouble or anything untoward going on. They also noticed when they left the venue, neither Mickey nor Brettley seemed to be intoxicated. Surveillance footage from the Taco Bell showed the two friends buying food just as Brettley stated, and it was all now but certain that he was being truthful about the night's timeline. With all of this information confirmed, they checked CCTV cameras along the route that Mickey would have taken home. And again, they were able to follow her movements pretty easily, as she appeared on several cameras along the way. But when she made it to St. Landry Street, the trail suddenly stopped. Detectives now knew that something must have happened to her at that exact spot, since she would have still had a short distance to travel to get home, a distance of about four miles or so. But police soon discovered a major cause for concern. In some of the surveillance footage, a white Chevrolet pickup truck could be seen driving behind Mickey, and since she wasn't cycling at any notable speed, they found it suspicious that the driver of the truck seemed to be driving so slowly, as if they were following her. If you consider that the average bicycle rider travels at a speed of about 10 to 12 miles per hour, it would be borderline difficult for a truck like this to trail behind someone on a bike without making a bit of a scene. The first theory as to what happened to Mickey was that she'd been involved in a hit and run accident and that she may have been injured. Fearing that she may still be in need of help, a search of the St. Landry Street area was carried out, but rescue workers were unable to find any clues. Not a single piece of evidence was found. The search was eventually called off. For many families, this is the point in the investigation when things begin to get really difficult. It's bad enough when you realize that a loved one has gone missing, but it's even worse when you have to admit that something awful may have happened to them. To top this off is the fact that no evidence has been found to give any clues as to where they may have gone. So wild theories start to emerge, and it often leads to unspeakable amounts of anxiety for the family. In the meantime, Mickey's friends and family had started a search of their own retracing the path Mickey would have taken to get home that night. By this point, local media outlets had also started reporting on her disappearance, which was certainly a great help. The official search started at Brettley's house, after maps of the area were printed and handed out to searchers. They'd been laminated and color-coded to show the areas that had already been searched, the areas where flyers had been put up, and the areas that still needed to be checked for clues or evidence. A tip line was also set up, and volunteers were manning the phones all hours of the day, just in case a new lead came in. The family had also contacted a private investigator, John Abdella, who started making his own inquiries, with a candlelight vigil being held in Mickey's honor that night. By this point, news of Mickey's disappearance was being reported nationwide, so it's safe to say that everyone had their eyes peeled for any semblance of suspicious activity, as well as for any sign of Mickey. On the 22nd of May, Military personnel joined in on the search, alongside Texas EcuSearch, who had arrived the following day. 
With all of these additional resources being called in to assist in the investigation, Mickey's family was hopeful that she would be found alive and well. But just a week after the investigation launched, they received some worrying news from investigators who'd finally found the clue. But it wasn't anything anyone would have hoped for. Mickey's bicycle had been found under a bridge in an area called Whiskey Bay. Not only was the bike located more than 25 miles from the last point where Mickey was seen in the surveillance footage, but it had also sustained serious damage to the back end of it, which investigators deemed to be consistent with being hit by a vehicle, her family's worst fear. The bike had been found on the 26th of May by a group of fishermen, but this discovery wasn't made public until the 28th. As worrisome as this clue was, her family was just as concerned about the fact that Mickey wasn't found alongside her bike. And although some progress had obviously been made in the case, it was starting to look as though foul play may have been involved in Mickey's disappearance. Following this discovery, the volunteer team was moved to Blackham Coliseum, where shirts and bracelets were put up for sale with all the funds that were received helping to pay for the search for Mickey. Investigators now decided to focus on the white pickup truck that was seen in the surveillance footage, and they released images of the vehicle to the public in hopes that someone would recognize it and reveal its owner's identity. Interestingly, investigators then identified two more vehicles of interest, but their owners were quickly traced down and cleared of any suspicion. Only the white Chevy was still missing, and at this point, news that Mickey's bike had been found, as well as the damage it had sustained, was released to the public. For the next four days, the case seemed to come to a standstill, as searches were temporarily put on hold, though they would be resumed again a few days later. But still, no new information came in regarding Mickey's whereabouts. It should be noted that while Mickey's case was being investigated, a different case was playing out elsewhere in Louisiana, specifically in Jefferson Parish, about 29 miles from New Orleans. A man named Brandon Scott Laverne had contacted the police to report that he'd been attacked by a man that he didn't recognize, and he sustained multiple wounds in the process. Laverne was receiving treatment for his injuries in a New Orleans hospital during his interview with police, but he was unable to provide them with any useful information, as he said he couldn't even remember where the attack took place, likely due to being in shock. In the meantime, a member of the public had contacted the police in Texas to report that they'd found a burned out white pickup truck, which they thought was suspicious, as the truck almost perfectly matched the description of the one from Mickey's disappearance. The truck's details were checked, and it was soon revealed to belong to Laverne, which was very interesting to say the least. While investigating his case, police looked up Laverne in their database to see if he had any sort of history. Interestingly, they discovered that Laverne had served eight years of a 10-year sentence, following a conviction for breaking into a woman's house, tying her up, and taking advantage of her. He was ordered to register as a sex offender, but failed to do so. While Laverne had initially contacted the police, claiming to be nothing more than an innocent victim of a violent assault, he was now looking more and more like a hauntingly suspicious criminal. By the 5th of July, Brandon Laverne was stopped by police officers who had a warrant for his arrest since he failed to register with the state after being released from prison. Just a short while later, detectives were able to place Laverne in the areas where Mickey was last seen riding her bicycle, as well as the area where her bike was eventually discovered. They were now certain that they had found the man responsible for her disappearance, but they still had no idea where Mickey was or what happened to her. Investigators compared the two timelines of the two investigations, and that's when things started to fall into place. First, they found that Laverne had checked himself into a hospital in New Orleans the day after Mickey went missing, and it's now becoming clear why he was unable to provide police with much information on the attack against him, since it likely never happened. All the information that had been gathered suggested that Laverne had kidnapped Mickey, so he was arrested and charged with kidnapping as well as taking her life since it was unlikely Mickey would be found alive by this point. Bear in mind, she'd been missing for over a month now. When Laverne was pulled over, investigators noted that he was driving a truck almost identical to the one that he'd reported stolen, which they found awfully strange, and they would later find that they were justified in being suspicious of him. News of Laverne's arrest broke the following day, and investigators added that he was refusing to cooperate with their investigation into Mickey's case, outright refusing to answer any of their questions honestly. Laverne appeared in court on the 18th of July, where he pleaded not guilty to all charges against him, 
but by now it was all but certain that he was indeed responsible for her disappearance, or at the very least, he knew more than he was letting on. While all of this was transpiring, Texas ECU search teams were still searching for Mickey in Lafayette. But frustratingly, they'd made no progress, as they were unable to find any further clues. By the 7th of August, after searching for nearly three months, they suspended their operations when investigators had their worst fears confirmed. They'd been contacted by a credible source, who told them they had information on where to search for Mickey. They were told to travel to an area near the intersection of Louisiana Highway 10 and Highway 13 in Evangeline, Paris, specifically to a wooded area next to a cemetery, about 45 miles from the area where Mickey was last spotted by surveillance cameras. And when officers arrived, well, As investigators pulled up to the area where the anonymous tip had led them, they made a very unfortunate discovery. Here, they located a set of remains just as the caller had suggested. The investigation team looked for further clues and arranged for the remains to be transported back to Lafayette. It would be an agonizing two-day wait for Mickey's family, but on the 9th of August, they were informed that the remains were positively identified as belonging to Mickey, and their worst fears became a reality. The Evangeline Sheriff's Office later informed Laverne that prosecutors would be seeking capital punishment if he were found guilty of ending Mickey's life. And this news seemed to have an impact on him, as he suddenly started cooperating, though he only did so under the condition that he would not receive the death penalty. Prosecutors agreed, but stated that Laverne would have to make a full confession and reveal all the details of the crime to investigators. So he jumped at the opportunity. It's kind of funny how these little birds are perfectly willing to claim someone's life, but when their own life is in danger, they suddenly start to sing. Laverne detailed the events of that weekend, starting on the 19th of May. He stated that he'd been driving around Lafayette in his truck early that morning when he spotted Mickey all alone riding their bicycle. His confession matched what was found in the surveillance footage, and he stated that he followed her around for a while before deciding that he was going to hit her with his truck, which he then did. When Mickey fell off her bike, he rushed over, grabbed her, and forced her into the vehicle. He then retrieved her bicycle and put it in the back of the truck, forcing her to stay inside by threatening her with a knife and a firearm. But what he hadn't anticipated was that Mickey was a fighter, and she wasn't going down easily. She wasn't someone who would just give up in a tough situation, so she tried to secretly use her cell phone to call for help. Unfortunately, Laverne noticed this and threatened her with a knife once more but Mickey pulled out a canister of pepper spray and sprayed him in his face, grabbing his knife as he was screaming. With Laverne now struggling with pepper spray in his eyes, Mickey managed to use the knife and attacked him repeatedly. Laverne knew by this point he was in trouble, and so he grabbed the blade with his bare hands, resulting in serious injuries, but he now gained control of the weapon, which he then turned on Mickey, claiming her life in a matter of seconds. By this point, Laverne was panicking, Things had certainly not gone according to plan, and for the next 40 minutes, he drove around looking for a suitable place to get rid of the evidence as well as Mickey's body. He eventually found a secluded area that he felt would suffice and he pulled over. But to his surprise, Mickey jumped up and continued the fight. She once again gained control of the knife and got him directly in the chest, ensuring that whatever went down that day, she wasn't giving up without a serious fight. Even with his life-threatening injuries, Laverne managed to grab his firearm and he fired just one round, ending Mickey's life. By this point, he was now in even more trouble, as he was now badly wounded and had life-threatening injuries thanks to Mickey's commendable determination. He had no choice but to abandon his plans for the time being, and he raced back to his house where he took off his clothes and attempted to treat his injuries, but he knew he would eventually have to seek medical assistance. He patched himself up as best he could and then got back into his truck. He then made the long drive to the cemetery, where he planned to bury her body, but due to his extensive injuries, he was unable to do so. Instead, he placed her in a tree line and covered her with branches, hoping that she would remain undiscovered until he could return to finish the job. He then drove to Whiskey Bay, where he disposed of her bicycle. Since he knew people would be looking for Mickey and her bike, he then traveled to a friend's house in New Orleans, later checking himself into the hospital, where he received treatments for his wounds, claiming that he'd been attacked by an unknown man. When he had sufficiently recovered from the injuries that Mickey had inflicted, he returned to Lafayette and buried her remains in the woods next to the cemetery. It's then that he became aware of the footage showing his truck following Mickey around, and he knew that he had to get rid of it before it was spotted. 
He then drove to San Jacinto in Texas, where he set the truck on fire before abandoning it and returning home. Once home, he reported the vehicle was stolen and bought an identical truck, which seems pretty pointless if you ask me. Why get rid of the truck just to buy the literal same truck again when you know police are looking for that truck? As we skip forward, we now know that Mickey had been found. The man responsible was behind bars, and it seemed as though Laverne would be locked away for life. But the story had one more twist when Laverne decided to make another shocking confession. Laverne would reveal that he was also the one responsible for taking the life of another woman, Lisa Pate, who had disappeared under suspicious circumstances in June of 1999, the year before he was sent to prison for the first time. He'd met Lisa in Lafayette that same year and had convinced her to accompany him on a trip out of town. She agreed, but for reasons that have not been disclosed, Lisa decided at some point during the trip that she wanted to go back home, but Laverne stopped her from doing so. Investigators believe that he ended Lisa's life by suffocating her with a plastic bag, after which he disposed of her body. She was found in September of that same year in the Church Pont area, where Laverne was living at the time. After this revelation, additional charges were added to his case, and he was eventually found guilty of everything. But why he suddenly confessed, well, that much remains a mystery. Laverne was sentenced to two life sentences behind bars, having narrowly escaped capital punishment. He was also ordered to remain in solitary confinement to perform hard labor, and was told that he would never receive parole and that his sentence would not be eligible for suspension at any point. To put it simply, this man was locked up as tight as possible. But he would soon complain that the conditions of his incarceration were cruel and unusual, and that he should have never been convicted of Lisa's crimes, since the district court only had jurisdiction in Lafayette Parish, and the crime had taken place elsewhere. He was also dissatisfied with his defense attorney, since they encouraged him to take the plea deal that was offered, and at no point objected to its conditions. He decided to appeal his sentence, but it was found that he had at no point been denied his constitutional rights, and his application to appeal was rightfully denied. But Laverne, having all the time in the world now, was still far from accepting his fate, since he decided to go on a hunger strike, but found it too difficult and started eating again after just four days. Still not content with the nature of his incarceration, on the 15th of October, 2018, Laverne seemingly saw a chance to escape, and he attempted to make it out of his prison camp by scaling a fence. But this attempt was quickly thwarted by prison guards after the alarm was sounded. As a result, he was separated from the prison's general population and had most of his privileges revoked, the few privileges that he even had at this point. He would still make several attempts to appeal his conviction, all of which were denied. This man is now locked up as tight as legally possible, and it's very obvious that prosecutors are ensuring he will never step foot out of that prison again. Mickey's case has finally been solved, and her family stated that they can finally start healing from the great loss they suffered, but they also vowed that her legacy would live on through a charity known as Mickey's Legacy. Mickey's Legacy, in conjunction with Spay Nation and the Wildcat Foundation, offers victims of domestic violence who are staying in a safe house the chance to learn about their pet's well-being and it also provides them with free medical and wellness services for their animals. One of the things you always hear about in domestic violence survivor cases is them finding refuge in safe houses that can be found all across the country. But what you never think about is that these survivors have to leave their entire lives behind. They can bring virtually nothing with them, including their pets in many cases. For victims like this, their pets are often the only thing that keeps them moving forward, the only comfort they can find. To be separated from their animals, it's almost like a form of torture. Mickey's legacy helps these victims maintain peace and comfort during their time of healing by helping them find a place for their animals to stay and also keep tabs on them while they're away. As an animal lover myself, I can't imagine being separated from our dogs, chickens, ducks, goats, donkey, any of them for any length of time. Mickey's legacy is doing everything they can to make sure that whatever the situation, Domestic violence survivors never have to lose access to their beloved animals. And what a noble and honorable goal that is. Thanks again to Dice Dreams for sponsoring today's video. Download Dice Dreams for free and enjoy quality time with no ads. Just click the link in the description. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe.
It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to show your support for the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.